What's well, nice to be with you. I wish I could be there in person. Um, it's getting to be winter here in North Carolina, so it's cold and the days are getting short. Um, that means I would imagine it's getting to be a lot nicer there in Australia. But today I'm going to give you sort of a, a clinician and clinical researchers perspective on some of the exciting things that have been happening in the last few years. I do have some disclosures. I have some research support from the ALS Association, a company called Medicine Nova, and a place called the Healy Center. And I have other financial support from a lot of different groups. I do a lot of work um, helping people to design protocols that are more patient-centric and working on DSMBs to try to make sure that studies are as safe as they can be for the participants. So there's gonna be three parts to my talk today. First, I'm going to show you how ALS care has evolved and highlight some of the newest and most exciting treatments. I'll tell you about some of the surprising challenges that we have to getting those treatments to patients, at least here in the United States. And then I'll finish by telling you why I'm very optimistic about the future of our field. So let's start with, with evolution. And if we're gonna talk about evolution, we have a, to have a starting place. So for me, my, my uh, experience with ALS starts in 1998. That's when I saw my first person with this disease. I was still a resident. And I'll never forget how amazed I was by the person's story and the collection of exam findings. I'd never seen such prominent and diverse findings in one patient. And I'll also never forget how horrified I was when my attending came in and said to the person, we know what this is called, but we don't know why it happens and there's really nothing we can do about it. You just have to go home and get your affairs in order. And I drove home that day and I decided I would try to change things. And I'm happy to say that a lot has changed since then. We have a lot of evidence and experience-based treatment options for people with this disease. In fact, there's entire books describing all the different options that are available. Our American Academy of Neurology does something nice about every decade or so. They look uh, across all the literature in a particular disease and they come up with something called the quality measures, the things that they think are the most important to do for people with that disease. And so they just updated the ALS quality measures a few months ago. And you'll see here that there's six of them. So one is a disease modifying pharmacotherapy should be discussed at least annually. Another one is ALS support services. Information should be provided at least once a year. We should be screening for malnutrition and dysphagia every three months. We should be screening for respiratory uh, impairment every three months. And if either one of those things is found, then we have to have a plan. We should be offering multidisciplinary team care at every visit. And we should be sure to be discussing patient care preferences, including end of life preferences at least once a year. And so just to drill down on a few of those, I think the most important one is this idea of multidisciplinary team care. To me, it's really the foundation of everything else that we do. And the reason it's so important is this disease can affect so many functions so quickly that it's nearly impossible for one clinician alone to keep up with it. And so multidisciplinary teams are defined as having an ALS neurologist and at least uh, four of the following specialists, pulmonologist, gastroenterologist, physiatrist, psychiatrist, social worker, occupational therapist, physical therapist, speech therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, respiratory therapist, genetic counselor, palliative care specialist, nurse, dietitian, assistive technology specialist, and a dentist. So the idea of using multidisciplinary teams is not new in ALS, but what is new is we have more data now to justify this than ever. So it's really clear now that people who come to multidisciplinary clinics throughout their disease, they live much longer, more than a year longer, and they have consistently better quality of life scores, and they're less likely to be hospitalized compared to people who don't come to these kinds of clinics. And I'm really proud of what I built at Duke. We actually have a 20 member multidisciplinary ALS team here now. We talked about disease modifying therapies and really the past year has been really exciting from that perspective. In the United States, we got two new FDA approved therapies in the past year. One is called sodium phenylbutyrate with tor ursodiol. This is a combination therapy that's believed to reduce neuronal death by mitigating endoplasmic reticulum stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. It's an oral suspension. It's dosed at one packet daily for three weeks and then 
one packet twice daily. This was actually FDA approved based on just one randomized placebo controlled trial that was done in very highly selected patients. And mainly what that trial showed was about a 25% slowing in disability accumulation as measured by something called the ALS functional rating scale, abbreviated ALS FRSR over six months. Patients were continued to be followed after the initial six months in what's called an open label extension. And there it became obvious that those who got this medication from the beginning were less likely to be hospitalized and were living significantly longer compared to those who got a placebo for the first six months. Now, interestingly, although this is FDA approved, there's another trial, a larger, longer phase three trial called Phoenix that's still ongoing, mainly at European sites. And we expect to have results from that probably in the first half of 2024. The newest FDA approved medication is called Tofersen. This is actually the first gene therapy that we have for ALS. It's an antisense oligonucleotide. It targets uh, the superoxide dismutase 1, SOD1 messenger RNA, and it knocks down uh, mutant SOD1 protein synthesis. This has to be delivered intrathecally every month. This is an even more surprising FDA approval. This is the first drug to ever get what's called accelerated approval in the history of ALS. So not only was there only one randomized placebo-controlled trial, restricted to people with ALS who had this mutation as a cause. But in this case, the main thing that changed was a biomarker called neurofilament light chain. And the advisory committee in front of the FDA had so much confidence that a significant reduction in neurofilament light chain would lead to a later clinical benefit that they approved the drug just based on that. And I think that this approval could, could really change the way ALS drugs are approved, at least in this country, for a long time to come. The nice thing here is that, again, if we follow patients for longer than six months in an open label extension, we started to see more obvious clinical benefits, trends in the ALS FRSR, the respiratory function, muscle strength, and quality of life favoring Toverson that became more obvious over time. There's one other medication that I want to highlight today. It's not really a new FDA-approved medication, but we have a new idea about how to use it. It's called dextromethorphan quinidine. This again is a combination therapy. It's got two ingredients, dextromethorphan hydrobromide, 20 milligrams and quinidine sulfate, 10 milligrams. This was FDA approved probably a decade ago for something called pseudobulbar affect. This is a, a symptom complex that people with ALS get where they lose their ability to control their laughing and crying. And so why am I talking about it today when I wanna talk about new things? because we have two very recent, well-designed clinical trials that show even in patients without any pseudobulbar affect, this medication can improve bulbar function. So it can improve the clarity of speech, a person's ability to handle oral secretions, and their ability to swallow. Now, unfortunately, there's no FDA-approved indication just for treating bulbar function, and that creates a bit of an issue with insurance, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. The nice thing about the five now FDA approved medications that we have to offer people with ALS is that they're all pretty safe. Really is all the oldest medication, a glutamate antagonist. Rarely, 10% of the time, you can have nausea, dizziness, abdominal pain. About one in a hundred patients will experience elevations in their liver transaminases, which is real easy to monitor for. A Daravone, an antioxidant, approved about five years ago now, 10% of patients have contusions or gait disturbances or headaches. This one I told you about, sodium phenylbutyrate with torosodiol. Most patients complain about the taste. About 25% of people will have GI disturbances, mainly diarrhea. And you do have to watch out for that one in patients who have enterohepatic circulation disorders or sensitivity to sodium. Dextromethorphan and quinidine, 15% or so of patients will have diarrhea, dizziness, or cough. Because of the small dose of quinidine, you got to watch out in patients who have QT prolongation or are at risk for it. And then finally, Tofersen, about 10% of people who get that antisense oligonucleotide have side effects. And those can actually include neurological side effects like papilledema, elevated intracranial pressure, myelitis, and radiculitis. 
So it's nice to have all these options, but they're not easy to use. So first, we got a lot of challenges here in this country to delivering multidisciplinary ALS care. The first is capacity. There are some websites now reporting that there are 200 multidisciplinary ALS clinics in the United States. Well, I've been to a bunch of them. Many of them are pretty small. Um, many of them only meet for a half a day once a month. And so even though there's more clinics than there's ever been, capacity is not great. And in my experience, new referrals may have to wait months to get into one of these clinics. The other problem is distance. So there was a study done a few years ago that showed that half of all the people in the United States with ALS are more than 50 miles from the nearest one of these clinics. And you can imagine as this disease goes on, people get more disabled, it becomes tough for them to travel. They may not be able to continue to attend clinic. Finances are a challenge. My institution loses about $200,000 a year with this multidisciplinary clinic that I've put together because we can't bill at a high enough level for the amount of time that we spend with patients. And then finally, staff resilience. You know, it's, it's not easy to take care of patients with a rapidly disabling, life-shortening disease. And when you work in a medical system where you're battling with insurance and sometimes your own institution to deliver the kind of care that you wanna deliver, it can really get you down. So I found some ways to deal with these challenges and, and maybe these will help you. So one, I have a telemedicine program and the really nice thing is it's sponsored by a patient advocacy group, the ALS Association. So I don't have ever have to bill patients who can't come to clinic anymore. I can see them through video visits for free. You have to learn to be a fundraiser if you wanna run an ALS clinic, at least here. And so I told you I have to now bring in about $200,000 a year and thankfully, most of it comes from one group, the ALS Association. And then finally, I've got to find a way to keep my team upbeat and engaged. And so I'm always on the lookout for fun things that we can do together that raise awareness of ALS, raise money for ALS research. We do journal clubs at fun places. And we've even started to do something called Fashionably Fighting ALS. This is a tribute to my lifelong love of wild and crazy fashion. The team now picks a theme and every month we all dress in the same theme. And I wonder if you can if you can figure out what the theme was for this particular week. So this was a week when we decided the theme would be dress as your favorite superhero. And I dressed as Doctor Who. And much to my surprise, everyone else on my team dressed as me. So I still kind of get the chills. Probably one of the nicest things anyone ever did for me. There's also challenges to these medications. So... Uh, I recently completed a survey of my colleagues in the United States that take care of lots of people with ALS. And I asked them, what percentage of patients in your clinic do you think should be taking the last three FDA approved medicines versus are taking? And you can see that there's widening gaps. So for really is all, my colleagues thought about 90% should be taking it, about 80% were. That's a gap of about 10%. With the Daravone, they thought about 50%, about 30% were taking it. That's a gap of about 20%. But with sodium phenylbutyrate torosodiol, we thought 80%, about 40% were taking it. That's a pretty big difference. Why is this happening? Insurance. So all the FDA approved medications have something called prior authorization, but Adaravone and um, sodium phenylbutyrate torosodiol and tofersen, they all have multiple denials that require appeals and ultimately something called the peer-to-peer -peer consult with a doctor who works for the insurance company. The bottom line is that it's taking us an outrageous amount of time now to get one patient, one prescription of one of these. Really is all takes us about seven minutes of effort. A Daravone or um, sodium phenylbutyrate torosodiol, it's over a hundred minutes of effort per prescription. And that results in delays between when we write the prescription and when patients get it of about a month and most of us believe that those delays are harming patients. So how do I try to use these medicines? Well, I present really is all right away. I think it's the most proven medicine we have. Most of my patients want it. They can usually get it the same day. I check my patient's liver functions before I start it. And then I recheck it monthly for three months. And then every three months after that. The medicine I have the second most confidence in is sodium phenylbutyrate torosodiol. I also present that on day one. Again, 90% of my patients want it. I told you before, it takes time. 
So it may take weeks before we know if they can get it, and about half will never be able to get it. Adaravone is a medicine that I'm a bit unsure on. It's actually got only two clinical trials, one positive, one negative. The difference between the trials uh, had to do with the inclusion criteria. And so if this works in anyone, it, it probably works in people who are real early in the course of the disease with a lot of function with at least an average progression rate. And so about a quarter of my patients want it. Uh, ultimately, 20% of those will be unable to get it because of insurance. I present dextromethorphan quinidine to my patients with pseudobulbar affect or bulbar dysfunction. Unfortunately, only those with pseudobulbar affect are typically getting it paid for. If I have any question about the QT interval, I do an EKG and I present toprosin to anyone who has an SOD1 mutation. It takes me about a month from the first visit to know that because most of the time genetic testing hasn't been done. This is a very difficult medicine to, uh, to roll out, not only because of insurance, but because of the need for the monthly intrathecal infusions. And we still don't have it at my institution, but hopefully we'll have it soon. So there's a lot of, lot of exciting things happening, and I'm even more excited about where we're going in the next three to five years. There's more interest from sponsors now than I've ever seen. Believe it or not, uh, a couple of days ago when I checked on clinicaltrials.gov, there were 140 ALS trials recruiting worldwide. I mean, I think the first year I started, there was one. Uh, we've got all of these new targets, lots of new gene therapies. There's somebody targeting a toxin called beta-methylaminoalanine, a retrovirus called HERV-K, something called Staphman-2, the nuclear pore complex, the integrated stress response pathway, things I had never heard of just a couple of years ago. And we've got all these new ways to do trials that are so much more efficient. So you may have heard of something called the platform trial, which is um, something that um, my colleagues at Mass General Hospital borrowed from the hematology group. And so this is a, a way to just sort of do what's called a perpetual trial. You set up a trial one way, you're gonna have one set of inclusion criteria, you're gonna have one set of outcome measures, and then each new idea that you get, you study it with the exact same design. And the advantage there is that you don't have to start all over with contracts and FDA approval and IRB approval, which takes about a year. You can just plug each new idea in as an addendum to the original trial, which takes just a couple of months. We've even got something called virtual trials, which I've been sort of leading the efforts on at Duke. These are trials where people don't have to come in at all. We can do all their visits uh, through telemedicine. And then we've got, uh, we're on the cusp, I think, of much better ways to measure ALS. You know, Using those clinical measures that I told you about before, like the ALS functional rating scale, we've learned we need just the right kind of patient. And even then it's dicey. If we're looking for a 25% slowing, it's gonna to be tough to see in six months, we may need to go longer. And so now there's, there's a whole bunch of new ideas about you know, wet, wet uh, ALS biomarkers like neural filament light chain and digital ALS biomarkers. Like for example, um, speech analysis that can be done on someone's home computer, as well as uh, wearables, these sort of Fitbit type things that measure uh, how much activity someone's doing with their arms and legs. But my favorite reason for optimism is patient partnerships. And really, if, if people don't remember anything about me when I'm gone, I hope this is the thing they remember, um, that early in my career, I was stunned by how poor our enrollment rates were in our clinical trials. And I did a survey to try to understand it. And it was really just the tip of the iceberg. What I learned was there was a huge disengagement in the patient community. You know, researchers were asking patients in clinic if they wanted to be subjects. And, you know, patients would turn to us and say, I mean, why didn't you ask me about this study? I would have, I would have loved to help you um, come up with an idea that maybe would be more exciting to patients, come up with a design that might be more feasible for us. They wanted to be partners, not subjects. And so I looked around and I saw what the Parkinson's community was doing to facilitate that. They were creating something called clinical research learning institutes, crash courses where they would bring patients in and they would teach them over a weekend, you know, what does it take? to get an idea from a test tube into uh, an approval in a country for a disease? And where are some pressure points that patient advocates could help with? And so we've now held 27 of these ALS clinical research learning institutes all over the world, including in Australia. And we've now trained well over 600 patients and caregivers to understand research better. And when they graduate, we don't just turn them loose. We ask them to meet with us once a month 
by video conference through something called the Peace Committee, Patient Education and Advocacy Committee. And there we have different stakeholders present ideas to this empowered group of, of patients and caregivers. And you know, they give us feedback. And so, you know, they're they're out there making our studies better, they're raising money, they're talking to policymakers, they're changing laws, they're improving awareness of studies, and they're even up in front of the FDA, you know, helping the FDA to understand what a new medicine might mean to patients. And, you know, if you ask my opinion, I, I don't think that the last two FDA approved drugs in the United States would have happened if it wasn't for the compelling testimony of, of our patient advocates. The other thing I learned from, from patient partners is about what I call alternative and off-label treatments. You know, I've been lucky my whole life. I've never been seriously ill. And I guess I just didn't appreciate that a person who is seriously ill is going to go home, even with a long list of evidence and experience-based options, and they're gonna search for something more. It's just human nature. If you tell someone, you know, that this can slow your disease, they're gonna to wanna to try to find something better, something to stop it or reverse it. And if you go on the internet, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people advertising products for the treatment of ALS. And you know, the problem with the internet is there's a lot of breadth, but there's very little depth. And there aren't any internet police to hold anyone accountable for the claims they make. And so, you know, you'll see a product and you'll see these extraordinary statements like, you know, perfectly safe, guaranteed to, you know, stop or reverse your ALS, but there's usually no data provided to back up those claims. And if all that wasn't bad enough, I mean, we've seen numerous examples of harm come to people who pursued these sorts of internet AOTs, physical harm, psychological harm, financial harm. And, you know, these things are actually harming our community in a scientific way because many times patients are so compelled to go to some unusual clinic or buy some unusual product by what they read on that website that they don't come into our clinical trials. And so it harms our enrollment rates. And sadly, as I started to appreciate this, I realized that really none of us knew what to do about this. We never got any training in how to guide people on these kinds of things. And so I got together with a handful of colleagues back in 2009 and started this program, ALS Untangled, and the idea was um, we would you know, create a space for people to share things that they were thinking of trying, and then we would you know, put our heads together and scientifically review these and hopefully help people with this disease make more informed decisions about these products. And to me, this is the closest I'm ever going to get to the old X-Files TV show. When I was a kid, I always wanted to be Fox Mulder on that show, and I'm kind of like the Fox Mulder of ALS, tracking down some of these really unusual ideas. And so there's three parts to what we do, inputs, investigations, and outputs. And they all revolve uh, around our website, www.alsuntangled.org. So ideas come from people living with ALS. And when we get a new idea, we post it on the future review section of our website. And there's so many ideas I've realized I'll never live long enough to get to all these ideas. So we prioritize them based on votes. Anybody can go onto that section of our website and click the vote button next to one of these topics and it'll move up. But we also multiply the votes by one, if we can at least understand what it is, by zero, if we can't find any useful disclosable information about that thing, and by two, if that thing actually has a case series or a trial published about it. We had to develop a science for how to do this because uh, to my knowledge, there never has been and still isn't anyone doing this in any other field. And so first I put together a team and that's really grown. There's 130 clinicians and scientists now working on this from a, across 11 countries. And you know we're always open to having more. So you think you might wanna be involved in this, just shoot me an email. And we develop these standard operating procedures that guide everything we do from how we gather information to how we write the drafts around something called the table of evidence and to how we ultimately crowdsource and publish these things. Once we have a, a draft that we like, we send it into a journal called ALS and Frontal Temporal Degeneration. It gets one more independent peer review. We respond to that, and then it gets published. And all of our reviews are published through an open access agreement, so patients and families never have to pay to read these. We post them on our completed review section of our website, so if you can't find the journal, you can always go there, and you can see the 71 things that we've reviewed. You can click on the name, it'll open up a PDF of the review. And you can also see the table of evidence grades 
that we gave that particular topic. And you know, we've learned over the years that people are changing in terms of how they want their information. Like it seems to me that more people want to listen to their information now than read it. And so we've created podcasts now with a group called uh, Create. And we also realize that there's people in other countries that may not be fluent in English that want this information. And so we've now started to uh, partner with a group in Spain and a group in Italy to, tra to translate our website into those languages. So this is incredibly time intense. It takes me about 40 hours for each one of these reviews. It's fair to ask, you know, is it worth it? I can tell you that it's been recognized by a lot of different groups, my peers, the patient community. We've received a lot of really nice awards. Even more meaningful to me is the fact that it looks like people are reading our reviews. So our journal keeps track of its most downloaded reviews. We have eight of the top 10. Some of these individual reviews have more than 40,000 downloads. Collectively, the series has over 300,000. The podcasts have over 20,000 listens. And I have to say that this program has taught me more surprising lessons than just about anything else I've ever engaged in. So one of the lessons is that the people who sell these products, they actually have an incredible bedside manner. And you know, mainstream doctors need to study the way they interact with patients. They're so much more optimistic, respectful, and responsive than most mainstream doctors. I learned lessons about the products, you know, I thought most of these products were going to be, you know, uh, the equivalent of snake oil. And, you know, we certainly have seen some, some bad products. And what we've learned is that the worst products that we've looked at share some things in common that we call the red flags. And so if you have a patient come in and they've got some new website that we haven't reviewed yet, you can sit down with this list of 10 red flags and you can ask how many of these are associated with this particular website. And if there's several, it's probably worth staying away from. But the thing is, a lot of these products are actually quite promising. They have plausible mechanisms. Some have preclinical data. Some even have positive, though flawed, human trials. The problem is none of them have a large, wealthy pharmaceutical sponsor behind them. And so it's very unlikely that any of these things will ever be taken into the kinds of studies that would we required for FDA approval. But without a doubt, the thing that I learned that surprised me the most is this. There actually are people who recover from ALS. And so the first one of these I ran into was uh, in the midst of an ALS Untangled review on energy healing. And it was this woman, Nelda Buss. She had a video on the Energy Healers website. It was one of those things that I thought was too good to be true. But I found her on social media and she spoke with me on the phone for a long period of time. She sent me all of her medical records in the mail. And long story short, I was absolutely convinced that she really had ALS and that she progressed to where she was paralyzed and near death. And then over the next few years, she recovered completely. And she's still alive and doing well 30 years later. Um, and it turns out that she is not the first or the only one of these. So as I started to talk to people about this, I was clued into a literature that no one had ever mentioned to me. Dating all the way back to the 1960s, there have been cases reported in the literature of people who appear to meet diagnostic criteria for ALS, progress for a while, and then just turn around and recover. And you know, I think this is a topic that's worth studying. Um, and my precedent is the HIV elite controllers so within HIV, there's a group of people who get infected with the virus, but never get sick. They never get AIDS. And for a long time, people just shrugged their shoulders. And then somebody studied them and said, wow, a lot of these people have the same genetic polymorphism. It's in a gene called CCR5. And they asked, well, what does that gene do? It codes for a cell surface receptor that HIV needs to get into cells and make people sick. And so Pfizer jumped on that discovery and built a drug that blocks that receptor that works for everyone with HIV. And so if you're going to study something, you have to be able to define it. And so I've got an operational definition of an ALS reversal now. There's three parts. I've got to have your records, not just your word. Um, and I've got to be able to see in those records a history, an exam, an EMG, and testing for mimics that convinces me that the diagnosis is right. There's got to be progression of weakness to where a person is disabled. And then there has to be a dramatic and persistent recovery of lost motor function and disability. 
And so there isn't one measurement I can give you that applies to all these patients, but here's some examples. I've got people who were ventilator dependent and now breathe on their own normally. People who needed a feeding tube because they couldn't swallow, now they swallow whatever they want. People who'd lost their speech and now they talk normally. People who are wheelchair bound and now they can walk and run. People who were totally dependent on someone else for their activities of daily living and now they're independent. And so I've got two programs at Duke for studying these ALS reversals. The first one is STAR. So here we're trying to find as many of these as we can. We're doing a lot of advertising. We're talking about this to everybody that we can think of. And as of this week, we have 60 confirmed ALS reversals that meet my definition. We're putting them all into the first into a database for the first time together to look at their demographics, their disease characteristics, their comorbidities, the things they took, the things they were exposed to. We're getting biological samples on as many as we can for genetics, proteomics, metabolomics, microbiome. And we're asking them questions about the things they might've been exposed to. And so I know time is short. I can tell you um, the most exciting of all the findings in the STAR program are these two. First, some of these ALS reversals actually have family histories of ALS, four out of 60. And some actually have confirmed ALS causing genetic mutations. So of the 30 or so that we've been able to do whole genome sequencing in, two appear to have ALS causing mutations. And so to me, the biggest criticism I typically get when we talk about these is, oh, these are, these are mimics or something that you're missing. It'd be pretty weird to have a story, an exam, an EMG that look just like ALS and a family history of ALS and an ALS causing gene and actually have a mimicker. So the other finding is the one that uh, I'm probably most excited about of all the things I'm working on right now. We just learned that there's a very unusual polymorphism in many of these ALS reversals. And this is plausibly related to how they might've recovered from ALS. So about 30% of those that we could genotype have a polymorphism in something called insulin-like growth factor binding protein seven. This polymorphism is rare in people with typically progressive ALS. It's 14 times more common in reversals. And furthermore, we've got about 10% of reversals that were homozygous for, for the polymorphism. That's never been seen in a person in a database with typically progressive ALS. So what might this polymorphism do? Well, we think it actually might result in more available IGF-1 in the brain. And there's a whole literature on IGF-1 and ALS. And so, We've got some ideas as soon as we can raise some money for what we want to do next. We want to actually measure IGF-1 levels, establish cell lines, and see what IGF-1 metabolism looks like in these patients. But we may wind up back doing another IGF-1 trial in a much smarter way than the way they were done 20 years ago. The other program, the, the last thing I'm going to say is the other program on ALS reversals is called ROAR, replication of ALS reversals. And so here I'm doing small pilot trials of some of the AOTs that were associated with these reversals. Now, because these products are generally regarded as safe, and because I'm looking for such a huge signal, not a 25% slowing, but a recovery from ALS, these trials can look very different from your typical pharma-sponsored trials. We can have wide inclusion criteria. We don't need placebo controls. We can use historical controls. We don't need very many, maybe no in-person visits. And finally, I'm gonna publish the protocols that we get IRB approved here, because I know there's people all over the world who wanna try things. And at least you know here they can have a roadmap that they can take to their own doctor and say, could I try the exact same thing that Bedlack's trying in his ROAR uh, program? So we've done a few of these ROAR trials, and unfortunately we haven't found anything that reversed ALS yet. But what we have learned is that this way of doing trials, it's much faster and it's much cheaper than traditional industry-sponsored trials. And so we're gonna keep doing this, but we're gonna add another wrinkle. And so um, probably early 2024 now, this has been pushed out a little, we're gonna do a very unusual ROAR trial, which is called the ROAR DIGAP trial. And we're partnering with a group there in Australia called Genius. And so this is gonna have a lot of the same features as our other ROAR trials, except this time we're gonna to attempt to personalize treatments. We're not gonna give everyone the same product. And the way that we're gonna do that is uh, upon enrollment, we are going to do whole genome sequencing and send it to, to Genius where they will run that information through their DIGAP platform. 
And we believe they will be able to tell us which one of four categories is most likely driving each patient's progression. So we believe there's gonna be a neuroinflammation category, and we're gonna treat those patients with a supplement called astaxanthin, an oxidative stress group that we're gonna treat with protandum, a group that has disrupted intracellular transport and autophagy, and we're gonna treat them with melatonin, and a group that has mitochondrial dysfunction, and we're gonna treat them with MitoQ. So just to kind of wrap up what I told you today, I never could have imagined, you know, in my career that I would see so many new evidence-based therapies which can help people with ALS. I, I think that these are best administered by these multidisciplinary clinics, even though there's challenging, it's challenging to run these, it's doable. And there's so many reasons to be hopeful about the future of ALS care, especially the fact that patients are our partners in our research. And you know these patient partnerships have not only accelerated research, but they've taken me personally in some directions I never knew I would go. And so thanks to anyone with ALS who's listening um, for, your, for your motivation. I mean, you're the reason I'm still in this field. You're the reason I get up every day and fight so hard. And um, you, know, you not only inspire me, but you participate in my studies and you even make donations. Thanks to my Duke colleagues uh, who helped me build this foundation of great care upon which all my ideas are built. And thanks to um, all my partners, my collaborators all around the world, including Genius, who I believe is in the audience with you today. And I'll be happy to take some questions now. Thank you, Professor Black, uh, Black for such insightful, inspiring, and success from your multidisciplinary program, uh, especially for EMCRs as me, also uh, as a um, young uh, PI to learn a lot how to shape this and uh, LS research community better. And that's why we are all here from these four minutes multidisciplinary uh, cross um, biomedical clinical science and technology uh, to end LS together. Yep, so any questions from the audience? Get them. Thank you, Rick. Uh, brilliant talk. Um, we face a number of the similar challenges, I think, in Australia that you do, particularly the distance challenge of patients not being close to a multidisciplinary clinic. So it's really good to hear that you think that um, the telemedicine is a, is a great option. And if you, for patients that are more regional, uh, are there aspects of that multidisciplinary care you think are more critical to trying recruit locally rather than other aspects of it without sort of cherry, I guess, cherry picking disciplines? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, you know, traditionally the, one of the most important things that we do in person is measure spirometry because there's so much that comes off that measurement. So like, for example, we have respiratory muscle training that we do uh, when we see that someone's uh, force vital capacity is, is starting to drop under 100%. We have non-invasive ventilation and cough assist devices and suction machines when we see that measurements of, of uh, force vital capacity are approaching 50% or peak cough flow is, is getting low or people are having trouble you know, handling their secretions. Um, it also matters as far as when we start talking about a feeding tube, when we start having conversations about tracheostomy and invasive ventilation and, and end-of-life preferences. It matters for who might be a candidate for a trial and who isn't. And traditionally, those have been difficult to get unless people actually come into our clinic. But, but that's changing. So I don't have this technology yet, but I know some of my colleagues here, like Zach Simmons at Hershey Medical Center, has found a way to purchase spirometers and get those out to patients. And he actually does his telemedicine with a respiratory therapist. So the respiratory therapist coaches the patient through the spirometry in the patient's home. The, the therapist is with Dr. Simmons at his clinic. The patient is home with the spirometer and they're able to get those measurements that way. And I think you know that's the era that we're coming into. I talked about the digital biomarker for speech intelligibility. I mean, I, I think that we're gonna have more and more of these things that we can do virtually. Um, so I, I do think that things are gonna get better from a standpoint of being able to take great care of people who can't come to clinic. But 
we're not, most of us are not quite there yet. Like we don't have all this. So to me, I mean, the breathing is, is the one thing that I would make sure that you're able to get accurately measured in all your patients. Thank you. Yep. So another one, quick question. Derek, yeah. Uh, Dr. Beglatt, thank you for a very inspirational talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, it's my view, and I guess view of other research like Luke Kapoor, that the translation of IGF studies from the mouse into the patient failed because there wasn't a systemic upregulation of IGF-1. It was always intramuscular, and it just didn't get where it goes. How do you propose to get IGF-1 into the brain? Well, the short answer is I don't know yet. <laughs> so... Um, I think the next step is, you know, we have this theory about what this polymorphism does. And I think, you know, before we reopen um, yeah, an old wound, I guess I'll call it. I know there was a, there was a lot of, before my time, I heard there was a lot of sort of arguing in the ALS community about those IGF-1 trials. Because if you remember, there were three. One looked pretty good, looked pretty positive. The other two didn't. And ultimately it was decided that it wouldn't be taken forward. And so I know, you know, we we keep seeing these cycles where the where the community argues about something. Most recently, we had the argument about the stem cell um, protocol called Neurone from Brainstorm. But but my understanding was there was once this big argument about IGF one. And I think before we reopen that old wound, the first thing we want to do is ask ourselves: Are we right about what this polymorphism is doing? Can we can we measure a higher higher IGF one level in the spinal fluid? Or is there a difference in the way that IGF-1 is being processed uh, in the iPSCs that we might be able to make from these uh, reversals with and without the polymorphism? And I would say that hopefully we can get all that done in the next two years. And then we can together look at it and say, if, if there is a higher level of IGF-1, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to double it, triple it? Um, and then that gives us a rational way to think about our target. Because as I read back through those trials, I mean, it was a different era, obviously, but it doesn't even look to me like they tried to measure IGF-1 levels in the in the CSF. Um, so it's not it's not clear to me that they even elevated the IGF-1 levels with the way that they were giving it. Um, so it's hard to say that that those trials were failures. I would say they didn't work, but we don't know why. Um, and so it it may be worth going back there, but I think I'd like to see a little bit more to prove the hypothesis that we have about that polymorphism before we go into um, into that area again. Cool. Um, sorry about time. Uh, yep, we need to end here. And um, thanks, Professor Black, for your time with us. Chewing from America with beautiful swimming pool and background. <laughs> and then I hope you enjoy your Friday night. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone.